I'm Rafiq Gubran, the Dean of the Faculty of Engineering and Design here at Carleton University. So welcome to the Roadmaps lecture uh, featuring Antoine Paquin. So Roadmaps is a lecture series founded by, in part by Carleton alumni that examines the path global leaders and entrepreneurs have followed from university to professional success. Science and engineering are both Carleton strengths and in-demand disciplines in today's business climate. I know that many of you asked yourselves as you go through your studies exactly what kind of career would I like to have? What kind of careers lies ahead for me? So the options, as this lecture series will show, are many and varied and not always predictable. So to help you on your route from the classroom to an outstanding career, I hope that you'll find that the lessons that you learn from others and surprises and inspirations in the path chosen by other will lead you through uh, the path of success. I hope that today's lecture will help you think about many other opportunities, many other doors that you can uh, uh, go through. So tonight's lecture is given by Carlton graduates, uh, Antoine Paquin. So Antoine graduated from computer systems engineering with a bachelor uh, in uh, 1989. I had the pleasure of having Antoine in a couple of my courses. He was a top-notch student there, and also Antoine did his fourth-year project under my supervision. We still have the fourth-year project in the lab, by the way, Antoine. Next time we go to the lab, we'll look at it. So uh, Antoine quickly make, uh, made his name, a name for himself in both the high-tech domain and business circles. After graduated, he joined Nortel as a chip designer, We've been asking him to come and do his uh, PhD here. We're still working on that, so hopefully we can convince him to do that in the future. So he was then involved in a number of startup companies. So he founded, for example, one of his first companies was Skystone Systems Corporation, a semiconductor chip manufacturing company that was purchased, purchased by Cisco Systems for $120 million US. Uh, He's invested a lot of money in many startups in the Ottawa area, startups in the area of security, wireless, data transmission. So examples include uh, Chrysalis, ITS, extreme packet devices, that was, by the way, sold for $600 million to PMC Sierra, Filsar Semiconductors, Watchfire, Solidium Systems, Cybercore, Xprima, Sedona Network, main source, so as you can see, he's invested in a lot of companies in the Ottawa area. And he also ran four companies, Filsar, Axiom, and uh, obviously Skystone, and now Solantro. So a millionaire at 30, uh, Antoine continued to invest in emerging products. He recently founded Solantro Semiconductor Corporations, where he's now president and CEO and he's going to tell us maybe a bit about that in his speech. So Mr. Paquin has combined his passion for technology and problem solving with business savvy and entrepreneurial spirit. In his career, he's embraced risk to develop the market potentials in dozens of emerging companies and has helped shape the Canadian high-tech industry in the process. So it's my pleasure to welcome Antoine Paquin. I was um, asked by uh, the faculty to make a presentation and um, <clears throat> decided to put it around a topic that's very near and dear uh, to my career, which is um, the career of an entrepreneur. And um, I decided for a starter to highlight uh, probably the best entrepreneur we've seen in our lifetime. Uh, somebody I've never met, but um, who definitely went over and above the uh, call of duty. And uh, I'd like to start the presentation um, based on a pre uh, presentation he gave in 2005 at Stanford University uh, to the uh, graduating class. Some of you may have seen it, some of you may not, uh, but I think it's, uh, there's a very deep and fundamental message that I'd like to provide continuity to. I'd like to start to say also that uh, he is one of my role models. And like most of my role models, which include Steve Ford, I haven't met him. And not necessarily a role model for who he was. Um, 
everything I've read uh, about him and everything I've heard about him, because uh, the circles are very tight, uh, showed that he was a very difficult uh, human being. Some might have said despicable. Everybody loved working with him, uh, but really was admirable for what he dared and ultimately achieved. A little bit about me. As Rafiq said, I started as an engineer. Chose the path of uh, being a high-tech entrepreneur. Uh, actually fell in love with semiconductor um, chips at a very young age. That was my first love. I was hired thereafter by multiple venture capitalists uh, as a professional CEO. Um, this, these were two semiconductor firms. Spent time in angel investing and venture capital. Uh, I was actually a partner at Rowe Ventures. One of my partners was actually John Scully, who fired Steve Jobs. And now I'm back to my first love. I've done four startups in semiconductors. Uh, Skystone Systems, which is now, if you go to Canada, the um, R&D division of Cisco Systems in Canada. It's my first company. Philstar mm -hmm. Semiconductor, which was uh, sold to what is now Skyworks Solutions. We did um, RF um, chipsets. I then went to California, uh, where I ran a company called Action Micro Devices. Uh, today, that company ships over 300 million power amplifiers in the Chinese market and in Asia, all uh, CMOS power amplifiers. It was acquired by Skyworks, we, who bought my second company, and uh, ultimately went back as um, in semiconductors. Uh, this one was started in my home in a, a garage in California. And conclusion, stay tuned. I don't know what the conclusion will be. I also had made a big mistake. I ran a software startup. I thought it was just a different way to package technology. I was absolutely wrong. You learn a lot from mistakes. The key lessons I learned is I've never had a job. Well, no, I had, I'm lying. Actually, I had a job. It was called BNR, Bill Learn Research. And it was called serving my jail time whenever I sold a company. For the rest, I've always chosen a mission. The mission has always been what grabs you? What, what are the big trends in the, in the world that grab you that you want to go and solve? Another thing I realized very young, uh, similar to what you just heard, is you got nothing to lose. You may think you have something to lose, but you got pretty much nothing to lose. We live in a society that gives you tremendous reward for success. Not just financial, the reward of doing exceptional things. And is incredibly forgiving in the end of failure. Because there's no such thing as failure until it's death. Failure is just an interim step to success. It's a lesson. Another thing I learned as an entrepreneur, you need to have a very, very deep pool of faith. That faith will be tested. It will be tested in ways that are um, painful. If you don't believe in yourself, nobody will. Another lesson, I have been a professional CEO. I have been hired by professional uh, money managers, and I've started a company from scratch in my basement. It's a heck of a lot more fun when you build it from scratch. It's your culture. It's your vision. It's your view of how things are going to unfold. As an entrepreneur, a lot more fun. Build a company when it's hard, when the economy is in the tank, when everybody thinks the world is going to fall apart. The problems don't disappear. It's just people's willingness to adopt the risk in those times goes away. In bubble times, when the economy is doing great, head for the beach, go surfing. If I had followed that advice, I'd be a much wealthier man today. One that you've heard, culture is absolutely everything. Culture is a shared set of values that individuals who are trying to build something share together. The culture, to a very large extent, is what will make and break your company especially as your pool of faith will be tested to degrees you can't imagine right now. And last but not least, that failure is the greatest teacher of all. Through successes, my bad habits became stronger with success. With failure, I learned. And I learned every time because failure, if you do the proper analysis and objectively look at it, and that's a hard exercise to do, but you've got to do it, will teach you what you need to do to succeed. And the best way I've learned of doing that is something I call fast successive approximation. What does that mean? 
talk to your customer, talk to the market. If you don't understand the problem, you can't understand the solution. You first have to understand the problem. Your customers will not understand the solution. Rarely do they. They will understand the problem that they're facing. That is the opportunity. That is the root cause of wealth creation. And last but not least about failures, even the wars that you win will involve lost battles. It's only a battle. The war, well, the war is your life. This is how I started Cilantro. This is also how I started um, Skystone. They all start like that. This is actually a garage in California, and you can see the rack to hold the surfboards. So uh, we'd work 100 hour a week trying to figure out the problem, talk to the market. And when we were out of imagination, we'd just grab the surfboards, screw it, we're headed to the beach. And then we'd come back energized and get back at work. You got to get dirty. You can't understand the problem unless you get dirty. So a few laws of nature. Nobody wants to buy from a crappy little startup in the middle of nowhere. Where, you're based where? Ottawa? Where the heck is that? Nobody wants to talk to you. The only reason they want to talk to you, you're solving a problem they have for which they have no solution. On the investment side, nobody wishes to gamble away precious resources in an unproven model, company, and or team. What you'll find, if you have the calling of an entrepreneur, you'll find that people around you just don't get it. And it's not that they're stupid. It's not that they're less intelligent than you are. It's just they haven't thought of the problem the way you have. And you're asking them to put how many millions in your company? The burden of proof is ultimately about solving the problem. The only way to solve the problem is to talk to customers. Another point was uh, Steve Jobs was considered both crazy and a visionary. Same person at different times. The fact is visionaries are either crazy or they're dreamers until they're proven to be visionaries. That's part of the deep pool of faith you've got to have. Last but not least, what is a leader? A leader is somebody that people choose to follow. Steve Jobs was an outstanding leader. People hated him, found him despicable. He was difficult. He would put people to tears, shred them to pieces, and they'd still show up at work, and at the end, they would work for him all over again. That's a leader. So what's the reason, the raison d'etre for a startup, a new company, somebody that has no track record? Well, quite simply, it's all about problems and solutions. The only reason a startup exists is when you have either an existing or a new problem for which a good enough solution does not exist today. By definition, this makes it a greenfield opportunity. What does greenfield mean? Greenfield means that since nobody solved the problem yet, the rules of the game are not set. The rules of the game get set by first mover advantage. That is greenfield. And ultimately, you're not going to set the rules for being in greenfield unless you're willing to lead. Willing to lead means that you're willing to fail. An important point is that technology is never a means to an end. Technology is only a way of providing a solution to an existing problem. Very often you'll find that actually technology is just a way to economically solve a solution in a way that is very scalable. What, what you'll find is in a lot of cases, the first solution you'll deliver will be crappy. That's the test of Greenfield. If customers are willing to pay money because you're solving their problem in a good enough fashion, with what at first glance appears like crappy technology, you're on the right track. If you need to do a lot more work and plump a lot more money, you're on the wrong track. My experience with technology is most technologies create more problems than they solve. Again, a big test of are you on to a greenfield opportunity enabled by technology is that it solves more problems than it creates. How many people here think they want to be entrepreneurs? Wow, so you're not all here for the free food. These, these are not factual statistics. I call them intuitive statistics. I use it more as a figurative example. 
and it reflects what I've seen in my career as an entrepreneur and a venture capitalist. If you take a pool of 100 people, two people are freaks of nature. They're not normal. They are born entrepreneurs. There are eight fence sitters. What is a fence sitter? A fence sitter is somebody who, given the right mentorship and the right environment, the right culture, will become an entrepreneur because they'll figure out that it's not such a big deal after all. It is possible and you got little to lose. And of the other 90 that claim they want to be entrepreneurs, they'll still claim they want to be entrepreneurs in a few years um, time frame. Not, it's not for everybody. You can't be normal and be an entrepreneur. The real miracle of Silicon Valley, people always refer to Silicon Valley, and I've spent a lot of my career there. Silicon Valley is not a place. It's a culture. And the magic of that culture is that it does convert the eight fence sitters into successful entrepreneurs. You just have to drive around San Jose, Santa Clara, um, Mountain View, Palo Alto, and see the who's who of massive companies that started in a basement to realize the magic of that place. It's not about money. It's not about a place. Yeah, the sun is nice. There's something funny in the air, probably something funny in the water, but it's the culture. And the challenge outside of Silicon Valley, and this is a challenge that I've seen in Boston, in Canada, in Texas, the challenge is keeping your two freaks of nature because chances are they'll want to head to Silicon Valley. So what do you need to succeed? You gotta be slightly delusional. You gotta be abnormal. I have an uncle who always told me that the rule of average, the rule of somebody being normal is the rule of somebody being average. And the rule of being average is if you have your feet in the oven and your head in the freezer, on average you're very comfortable. You can't be normal and be an entrepreneur. You've got to view the world differently. You've got to be delusional enough to believe in yourself because you don't have a track record when you first get started. You've got to have passion. Without the passion, you don't have the pool of deep faith that you need. And believe me, you will be tested. It is hard. There are times where it feels like you're headed for bankruptcy, failure, uh, shame, uh, these times will test you as you can't imagine. The only way you can get out of it is passion and faith. So you've got to understand in order to get there that you've got nothing to lose and everything to gain. And as you heard, in the end, we're all dead. Steve Jobs was wrong. His cancer was actually growing. It caught up to him. You've got nothing to lose. A few boring facts. Life is rescue. Those who think that they're not taking risk are living an illusion. They're living a lie and an illusion that's fed to them. It's just a degree of how deliberate you are in your risk taking and your willingness to embrace that risk. The degree to which you are deliberate about it to a very large extent will determine the outcome of your success. And what is risk? Well, risk is everything you don't know. When I look fundamentally at a human being, when I look at myself, when I look at my kids, who are a reflection of myself to a large extent, we are deeply flawed, deeply limited creatures. We don't have particularly big, big fangs or big claws. We're not particularly strong. We're actually kind of weaklings. We have limited senses. Risk is what you don't know and need to assume in that deeply flawed framework. It's the assumptions you make. How do you manage risk? You make assumptions and you correct them. You test those assumptions. That's what risk management fundamentally is all about. When you talk about VC, and th there's a section in the end that I have in venture capital, by the way, which I will not cover because that's not the point of this discussion, but it will be on the website, so feel free to consult it. Um, it gives um, a quick rendition of what venture capital is all about. For VC, it's different. Risk management is about portfolio management, diversification. It's it's a very different method. So in conclusion, true wealth happens through entrepreneurs and their creations. Steve Jobs did it. Steve Jobs is a modern version of uh, Henry Ford. There's been many of them in the past. 
they've all been weird, they've all been eccentric, they've been despicable human beings, they've been great human beings. They all created wealth because they dared. They did not settle. And you guys are in a wonderful position in this room. Some of you may have kids and obligations. The vast majority of you do not. That is a golden period in your life that's not going to replicate or it won't be as easy the, the next time you have kids and a wife. I was crazy enough to do it with kids and a wife and being the sole income earner. That's just a question of how crazy you're willing to be. What is a successful entrepreneur? Ultimately, it's a freak. It's somebody that is comfortable enough with ambiguity and risk to get started. You need that, that comfort to get started. But that's not enough. You also need to be deliberate in your approach because you're working on limited time, limited resources, limited money, limited credibility. You've got to be deliberate in your approach. And a large part of how you become deliberate in your approach to execution is the culture you surround yourself with, the team you build to share the risk-taking endeavor. You've got to be persistent. You've got to know when to be persistent. And you've got to be curious enough to get lucky. The fact is, luck plays a humongous amount. It has an incredible amount of importance in the ultimate outcome. But you get lucky by being curious and testing, by sticking your neck out, by facing ridicule. You've got to be passionate, and you've got to have faith. And ultimately, yeah, you do need luck and talent. I haven't met a single successful entrepreneur in my life, and I've met hundreds of them as colleagues, competitors, um, through networks. They all had talent. And they all got lucky. You got nothing to lose and everything to gain. So good luck for those of you who choose the path. So let's have some questions. So uh, we'll would start the first question. If you can give me... Um, a brief description of uh, your name and what you're studying. Sure. My name is Ali Morby. I'm a mechanical engineering student here. And uh, I'm working with Richard here, and we want to start a company ourselves in robotics. So I guess a simple question. Should we head to Silicon Valley? <laughs> or you talked about the culture, but I'm being, I'm joking partly. But in, you know, what changes when you're there versus uh, when you're trying to do it here? And how do you build that team around you? I spent my entire career um, relocating to Silicon Valley and being brought back here by a woman. Um, whom I love very much, by the way. Silicon Valley is a wonderful place. And I've always said, whenever I come back from there, why do I love it? Because I feel normal there. It's, uh, you, you, you are going to be more normal there, and the culture is different. But that reminds me of an old, um, an old fable or analogy story about the field of diamonds, about the gentleman in South Africa who sold his farm to go hunt for diamond mines and find his diamonds, only to find out many years after the fact that there was a big diamond mine right in his own backyard. Where you do it does not matter all that much in the end the team will matter far more. It may be a lesser path of resistance, but it's also more competitive. Um, what I found typically uh, in, the, in the Bay Area, it's very hard to build a team that will stick through the hard times. They'll all be there when the stock options and the big salaries are there and you'll get the best people. The moment you hit hard times, the rats leave the ship. That's the negative side of Silicon Valley. The positive side of Ottawa, your people will stick by you if they believe in what you're doing. So it's a trade-off like anything else you'll do. It's like engineering. Everything you do in engineering is a trade-off, right? It's exactly the same thing. Engineering company is no different than engineering a solution. And where you do it is important to the extent of who you want to surround yourself with. And a big part of... Um, a big consideration in where you build a business is what can you leverage? Your, your personal networks. 
be it customers, be it potential partners to build a company with, where is the critical mass that will allow you to develop your business from? That's, and it's, not, it's never easily answered. I've actually found that Ottawa is a great place for that. Although, even building companies from Ottawa, I spend half my time in Silicon Valley. Uh, name's Chris Aviv. I cite biomedical and electrical engineering here. Uh, my question to you is, when you're doing your startup, do you find that you should that you do it on the side while you're working for another company, or does it require all your focus and effort that you follow your passion and actually dive into your startup? Everybody starts it on the side. And the single hardest decision is when to shift from on the side to full time. And again, it's, you're never sure about the final decision. It's a gut feel. It's an act of faith. You do it when you feel that you're willing to go all the way, be it failure or ultimately building a large business. But all of us started on the side. Every single company. Hi, I'm Vilas Joshi. I'm a biomedical student. I used to work in BNR too. <laughs> Great place to be from. <laughs> Great place. Uh, my question is, would you want to be closer to your customer base? In, for example, in biomedical, Ottawa, customers probably are, base is probably smaller, whereas your large customers may be far off. And uh, how do you make the network with, when customers are not co-located? Great question. I've sold, my, the products that came from my companies have sold in the billions of dollars. I have never sold a penny in Canada. Not one penny. Uh, you got to be close to your customers in the sense of being sufficiently in front of them to size the problem and understand the opportunity. When I built Skystone, <clears throat> I spent probably 40% of my time where my customer base was, which was Silicon Valley in Boston. And it was very important uh, to spend that time. Then I had to spend the rest of the time coming back to make sure that we understood internally well what the nature of the problem is and solve it. The fact is being across from your customer across the street is not that big an advantage because you only want to go see your customers once you have tangible progress to demonstrate to keep the dialogue going. Very often as you uncover the solution, it starts opening up the imagination of your customers that you are on the path to solving their problem and now they get interested and the understanding of the problem evolves and there's touch points. Too many touch points, you're wasting their time. Not enough touch points, you're really delusional. It, it's a balance of the two. Um, now, there, there are advantages once you're in business development mode. Once you've solved the problem, you have a product, and you're scaling um, the, the, the ramp of sales of your product, being in close proximity to your customers helps a great deal to scale up. But to get started, no. Just a continuation of that. What's up? Uh, so how much time you would spend, uh, you said 40% of your time went for traveling to customer, but you have to understand and save, develop the product to meet those requirements. You'll waste 99% of your time. It doesn't matter. It's the 1% that counts. It's the 1% where you hit that aha moment. You're on the something and you have a customer that is desperate enough to work with you. That's when you hit it. Or you can be a genius and know what the consumer wants without ever talking to the consumer because you know. Those are truly exceptional individuals. Very few people ever approach that. 
my name is Zahir. I'm studying electrical engineering. Uh, my question is, how do you look for problems to solve? How do you know that the problem is out there that needs to be solved? Or how to select the problem set? That's the creative side of you. If, you. if you're curious and you read a lot and you talk to a lot of people, uh, you start developing an intuitive sense for where the opportunities are. Um, I remember when I was at Cisco, <clears throat> I, um, that was in the, uh, around 1998, and one of my colleagues was an individual by the name of uh, Andreas Bestelsheim, who was the founder of Sun Microsystems. He had sold his company to Cisco slightly before I sold mine, and I stepped into his office to touch base. And um, I asked him if he was doing any uh, investing recently in startups. And he told me, um, yeah, 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 just uh, I had this uh, crazy Russian, in, I think another crazy Russian, who came to me with a cheap PC-based search engine, very scalable. And so you know, I wanted to get rid of him, so I wrote $200,000, and off they went. That was Google, by the way. Search was a problem. Intuitively, everybody knew search was a problem. They were not the first, by the way. Lots of people have figured out different search. They, figure out, they figured out how to make search a business that scaled and worked. If you talk to a lot of people, and yes, people will you'll share your ideas with them. Your ideas, by the way, I have never seen an idea that was that original in the end. What's original is how you solve the problem based on that idea. It's the execution. And the way you refine the idea is you talk to people. And yes, they'll know your idea, but your idea is not unique. There's 10,000 different points in North America alone that will have the same idea. You may be the only one that gets to the end point. So the creative side is, uh, 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 of figuring out a problem is you talk to people and you develop a sense for the problem. And you do a little bit of work on the side. You try to figure it out. You tinkle around. And eventually you go, you know what? I think we're on to something. Now you start talking to customers. There's no single path, by the way. This, is, this has been my path. But it's worked out well. <laughs>